Hi folks, welcome to our weekly-ish shop update. The subjects we'll be talking about are listed on the screen and I'll check them off as we go. So if you want to skip ahead, you can, but I'll know and I won't invite you to hang out in my shop anymore. As I mentioned in last week's vlog, we're building a vanity and a small cabinet for a guest bathroom. That's what you're seeing in the transition clips throughout this vlog, which are both visually interesting and audibly stimulating. The furniture is made from hickory, which is pretty difficult to work with. Not as bad as some of the super hard or brittle exotics out there, but it's one of the more frustrating American hardwoods because it splinters easily if your tools aren't sharp and it dulls your tools quickly, so it's the whole package of suck. But it's beautiful and inexpensive and very durable, so I use it from time to time. Speaking of durable, this has to be the sturdiest little cabinet we have ever built. We've been building a lot of shop fixtures using pocket hole joinery lately, so I wanted this project to be made with traditional mortise and tenon joints, so we can feel like real woodworkers again. But it's absolutely overkill strength-wise. You could park a Buick on this thing. And don't think we haven't tried to figure out how to do that just for the Instagram value alone. But traditional joinery is more fun, and it helps develop the essential skills that will be needed for larger pieces of furniture, like tables and chairs. So this will be a good project for those in our audience who may wish to build it. We'll have some plans for it down the road, and some more detailed videos as well. Last week, I showed you the two new workstations we'd built, which are modular designs, meaning you can pick and choose different components to assemble the perfect small or large station for your personal workspace. A lot of you were pretty excited about this, and I am too, and I've gotten a lot of requests for plans. We will be making plans and videos, but it's going to take a couple of months. These are complex projects, not for you to build, but for us to design and lay out in a way that makes sense and that's easy for you to follow when you try to build them on your own. So it's going to take some time, but I'll keep you updated. Some of our recent videos seem to have been controversial, or at least they've generated a larger than usual number of angry comments. I'm not saying I'm surprised. I knew the biscuit joiner video two weeks ago would stir some things up, and I expected some pushback on a couple of this past week's videos too. I mean, you can't talk about something so controversial as carpet without blowing up the internet, am I right? But it never ceases to amaze me how riled up some folks can get. Sometimes they can't even watch the whole video before they rush to the comment section. Take the radio alarm saw video from a few days ago. The whole point of it was to show some of the over-the-top practices recommended in the old catalogs. That's why I titled the video, Stupid Stuff People Do With Radio Alarm Saws, instead of, Radio Alarm Saws Are Stupid. And that's why I started the video by showing an example of a crazy radio alarm saw practice, and then came right out and said what the video was about. In a minute, we're gonna take a trip down memory lane through the pages of some of the old brochures from the 50s and 60s and see some of the nuttiest practices. If you paid attention to that introduction, you knew what the video was about. Not bashing radial arm saws, just bashing the crazy unsafe things people used to do with them. With that in mind, you probably found it pretty entertaining. You may have cringed at some of the illustrations, laughed at how stupid the marketing was a half century ago, and maybe you left your own experiences and opinions in the comments. But to a few people, this was an affront to a classic tool not seen since Roy Underhill used an 1870s distin to literally cut the cheese. You know the type. He's got five radial arm saws in his shop and he polishes every knob and fitting while scanning the internet looking for a fight with some unsuspected table saw user. He comes upon my video, and in his rage, he only sees the words stupid and radial arm saw. That's all he needs to make up his mind about this YouTuber. He clicks play, but he only listens to every fourth or fifth sentence. He can't be bothered to actually pay attention to what I'm saying. It's more important to formulate his proper beatdown to leave in the comments. So he pounds the keys and posts something like, you're just another idiot who doesn't understand that all saws have their own dangers and radial arm saws aren't inherently dangerous if used properly. But wait a minute, that sounds familiar. Which brings me to the obvious conclusion that all power tools, especially saws, have their own sets of dangers. 
I don't consider a radial arm saw inherently dangerous any more than I would a table saw or any other type of circular saw. Sorry, radial arm saw warriors. If you can't be bothered to pay attention to what's actually being said, I can't help you. I made the video, I can't watch it for you as well. Don't get me wrong, I'm not complaining that people leave angry comments without watching the full video. I think many of them are entertaining and all are a fascinating look at how the human mind works, specifically how you can think you're paying attention to something, but only hear what fits into the preconceived expectations you had before you first clicked play. The video could have been 10 minutes of me just chanting, I love radial arm saws, they never hurt woodworkers, and I still have both my arms to prove it. And some people would only hear, radial arm saws hurt people and I prove it. Taking a step back and watching reactions like that is one of the most fascinating parts of my job. So I knew what to expect when I made the radial arm saw video, and I welcomed it. Those comments don't bother me at all as long as they aren't insulting and abusive. The more the merrier, they make me laugh, they fascinate me, they boost my video in the YouTube algorithms, and they give us something to talk about in these vlogs. As most of you know, I had a non-radial arm saw related injury last October. I'll spare you the gory details and images this time, but basically I seriously cut two fingers and shredded two more. I was very lucky nothing was laying on the ground flopping around in the sawdust at my feet. But I did do some damage and it's been three long painful months since with at least a couple more to go. Now many of you have asked for an update, so here's my hand today. The back of this thumb was seriously chewed up, and that scar is going to be nasty for the rest of my life. It's still sensitive and a little stiff, but it's mostly healed. The tip of the index finger had a chainsaw tooth-shaped notch cut into the side that went well into the fingernail. But that's growing back nicely. I mean the nail, not the fingertip. I'm not a starfish. Things don't grow back. But you really only notice that part is missing if you compare the shape to my other index finger tip which is less pointy. The nerves are still pretty torn up, so it's difficult to do things like button my shirt or anything that requires pressure from that fingertip. My signaling finger seems to have the least damage, or at least it did at the time, but that cut across this lower knuckle may have done some damage inside because I've lost full movement at that joint, and it's pretty painful to force it to bend all the way. The worst damage was to my ring finger, the scar here isn't from the accident, it's from the surgery to repair the chewed up tendon inside. They had to open it right up, sew my insides, and then put a pin through the joint to keep it straight for six weeks. That pin came out about a month ago, and I've been in therapy ever since. For the first two weeks, it wouldn't bend at all. And after a lot of painful stretching and torturous devices, I'm almost able to bend it 45 degrees. I hope to get to 90 in the next couple months, but I'm not sure I'm ever going to have full movement back. We'll see how it goes. Now, if you're tired of hearing about it, imagine how I feel. It's impossible for me not to be thinking about this 24-7 because it's consumed the last three months of my life and it's going to dictate my life for another couple months at least. I made this update because hundreds of you asked for it, but I'm also trying to use this injury to help others. To that end, I have filmed a safety rant video that I may or may not publish. The theme is it can happen to you. And if it does, it's gonna be terrible. So think about that every time you turn on a tool without proper safety devices. I know that video will help a lot of people, but it's also gonna bring out the tough guys and the trolls and full force. So I'm, de I'm undecided if I'm gonna publish it. We'll see what happens. Thankfully, it's my left hand and I am right-handed but I'm also a woodworker, and as you know, we use both hands to grip things like chisels and other tools, so I haven't been able to do much work. That's why you see a lot more of Pete and Mustache Mike in these transition videos in this vlog than you see of me.
speaking of Pete and Mike, I get a lot of questions about who they are, who else works in the shop, and exactly what we do here. So I'm going to wrap up this week's vlog with a little behind the scenes info. This is Mustache Mike. He's my father, and he's been appearing in our videos from time to time for two years. He used to host his own scroll saw and other small project and tip videos on this channel, but he's mostly retired now and working for me on behind the scenes services like building fixtures, managing the property, which includes the postal service as a tenant, and other things required to keep things running smoothly. This is Pete. He doesn't have a nickname, nor does he want one. He doesn't like to talk on camera either. He's an experienced furniture maker that I hired to make specific projects that will be featured in our video content and our e-magazine because I don't have time to make a lot of furniture nowadays, and I wanted to start including more of that variety for our audience. You see a lot more of his hands than his face, and that's good for everyone. This is Chip McDowell, which isn't his real name. He's my stepbrother, and even though he has a youthful appearance of a much younger man, he's nearing 30. He has spina bifida, which you can Google if you like. He hangs out occasionally and has appeared in a few videos in the past. This is Office Amy. She manages the office, the website, and other business stuff, and she operates the camera and teleprompter when I'm standing behind the bench yapping like I am right now. The shop dogs are Puddles and Ruby. Puddles is a Beagle Chihuahua Boxer mix that showed up on our doorstep a decade ago, got a treat and a belly rub, and never went home. Ruby is a year-old mini Australian Shepherd. Her job is chewing up wood scraps, and she's afraid of the shop bathroom. Those are the folks besides me who work in and around the shop. Now, what is it we do here? Well, we do limited amounts of commissioned work, but mostly this is kind of like a woodworking magazine. Not in the strict sense, we don't publish a paper journal, but I think it's a good comparison because we operate in much the same way as a modern magazine, except more efficiently, and all of our content is online. While a magazine works on one issue at a time, we may work on a month's worth of content at a time. For example, during January we had about 16 videos on the schedule. I choose the subject for all the videos based upon audience questions or really whatever I think is interesting. If it's a project series, like a piece of furniture, I usually design it part by part with computer software in the office. Then I transfer it to the shop monitors so Pete can start on it. Pete runs his own camera as he works, but I check on him throughout the day to direct, making sure we're getting all the shots that we need. As he works, Pete may modify the design with the audience in mind, making notes so that I can make those changes when the plans are written later. Tutorial videos start in the office, where I sit down and I write about the subject, much like I'm writing a magazine article. Then I go into the shop and I film all of the B-roll, such as cutting the dovetails in a dovetail tutorial, all the stuff that your hands do. Then I may go back and modify the script if I changed my mind about something while I was actually doing it here in the shop. If it's a jig project, such as a homemade machine or one of the small jig builds that we have coming up, I design those first at the computer in the office because I can test different ideas before I waste a lot of time building it. Then I come back into the shop and I make a prototype for final testing, filming that process as I go. I also do the hand tool projects and educational projects for the new e-magazine here at the hand tool bench or in the small corner workshop while Pete's working in the main shop. That's the benefit of having this new larger space. We could do a lot of things, including multiple projects at once, especially because all of the footage is filmed without sound, so we don't disturb each other's camera work. Later, all that film footage is collected and processed in the office, and scripts are written for the project videos and any tip videos that may be extracted from those projects. Then, once a week, we set up a teleprompter, and I stand here behind the bench and film all the talking shots, which are later edited together with that other footage, the build footage, the B-roll footage, to make the videos. In the evenings, some of us have our own projects going on that may never make it onto YouTube because sometimes it's just nice to work without a camera next to you. That is how things are run behind the scenes at Stumpy Nubs Woodworking Journal. It's a full-time business just like any other, just a lot more fun. I hope all this sausage making doesn't ruin the magic, but that's how we're able to make a wide variety of what I think is interesting and educational woodworking videos, rather than just working on a few project videos a year that you may or may not be interested in. If there's a downside to all the hustle and bustle around here, is that we do have to sit back a little more often, and we do go through a lot more cold ones than we used to when it was just me. But we've earned it, my friend. 
MyWoodCutters.com is the sort of small business I like to support. Stefan is a great guy and he can find you knives and cutters for almost any joiner, planer, shaper, or molding machine. And his are the best prices if you're planning to upgrade to a helical carbide cutter head. Please use the link below this video to check with him before you buy somewhere else. Some small businesses are just worth supporting. Wait, don't go yet. If you're new here, please subscribe and remember to ring the bell. I would really appreciate that. Give us a thumbs up or better yet, leave us a comment. I always read them. And be sure to check out the latest issue of Stumpy Nubs Woodworking Journal. It's always packed with tips, tricks, and tutorials designed to make you a better woodworker.